Welcome back to the Procore Innovation Summit. I'm Kevin Sturm, Senior Director of Product Marketing here at Procore. If you missed the first session today, you'll be able to watch on demand at the conclusion of our event. We shared how Procore is investing in solutions to help our customers tackle the challenges in pre-construction, tying it to your course of construction activities so you can build smarter and more profitably. And now I'm excited to continue that conversation of how to build more profitably in this session. We're gonna discuss the challenges facing the industry around profit fade, what's causing it, and how the industry is tackling those challenges. So this topic of profit fade was something that we saw come up as an underlying theme in the Construction Cost Management Summit that we held in April. So I'm excited to have a deeper conversation about it now with three industry leaders and Procore customers. First, to start off, I wanna say thank you to Maria, Jim, and Bob for joining us today. And I'm gonna have each of them introduce themselves and share a little bit about their company. So Maria, would you like to start us off? Yes, hi everyone. My name is Maria Russo and I'm the customer experience manager at BW. We are a fit out construction company and we operate in London and uh, Southeast of England mostly. Thank you. All right, Jim, would you like to go next? Sure. My name is Jim Symbolista. I'm the Vice President of Construction for Ingerman Construction Management. Ingerman is not only a general contracting company, but we are an owner and developer primarily of affordable housing on the East Coast of the United States, primarily in the Mid-Atlantic States. And uh, we also own and manage the properties uh, once we build them. So uh, we have experience from uh, ownership and construction side of the business. Awesome. And Bob? Excellent. Thanks for having me. Uh, Bob Gardner, founder of Gardner Builders. Uh, we're a hospitality company that happens to be in the commercial construction business. We have uh, culture hubs in Minneapolis, Duluth, Minnesota, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and then we travel the U.S. with Gardner Builders U.S. We do primarily uh, fit out and ground up healthcare, retail. That's a wide variety of, uh, of product types. Awesome. So to start off, I think the first important question uh, is what are those challenges that we're seeing specifically in light of the last year that are leading to profit fade? So Maria, if you'll start us off, uh, and what are those challenges that BW is seeing? Uh, the most common one that we see at BW are things like loss of time due to changes that not being incorporated correctly into the program, um, missing important program milestones, getting close to PC, to practical completion with too many snags, um, poor subcontractors performance and additional works outside the scope or um, sometimes don't fully understand the client's requirements. Those are some of the challenges that we face at BW. Nice, uh, and for our, uh, for our US and Canada customers watching, uh, the quick translation there is snags are punch items. Uh, yeah. If you were not aware in the UK, that's what they call them. So uh, that's specifically punch items that Maria is referring to. And so, uh, Jim, for you bringing a unique perspective of, of a company that both owns and does general contract, what are those challenges that you're seeing around profit paid in the last year specifically? Um, well, I think when uh, financing is put together for jobs and early budgets are put together, um, uh, that often is a lot earlier than when the job buyout actually goes on and things have progressed. So um, trying to stay on top of that um, because of either scope creep might happen in the project, um, supply chain issues that can occur, um, or uh, just uh, finalizing of specifications and, and, and product. Uh, so those changes that can occur from the time you're financing a project till the time you actually get it on the books and are building, some time can elapse. So there's some difficulties there with trying to keep on top of all that. And Bob, how, how's that uh, agree or anything additional that you'd like to add to that? I agree with, with both. Uh, both Maria and Jim, I think some of uh, what I would add clarity to for, from our perspective is uh, being selected and having um, being a part of the process early on um, prior to normal pre-construction so that we can eliminate a lot of the ambiguity in scope and, and requirements from the client. And then when we have a client having complete clarity on 
what the end result needs to be from their perspective. Uh, and that we have a decision maker that makes decisions in order to keep the, the construction process going. Um, because profit fade usually comes where there's ambiguity in schedule and scope or material selection. And if that's not, those decisions aren't made quickly, uh, we slow down and that's where you see profit fade. And in, in preparing for this conversation, uh, I think in, in talking about those decisions, Bob, one of the things that kind of came up as a recurring theme was outside of technology and, and some processes we'll get to, which was just relationships is vitally important in this challenge of profit fade. Uh, and so have conversations, and I think that's maybe what you were alluding to, changed in the past for Gardner Builders on, on reducing profit fade and where do you see that going forward? Yeah, for, for us, I think being a part of the team early, as I alluded to, um, but also the relationships, uh, you know, the client hires us for a business objective and it's our job, uh, ours, the trade partners, design partners to do a phenomenal job for them. Um, so as if we can all be aligned and we start with trust with our trade partners, this is not a zero sum game. So if I win, you lose. Um, that once we build this, you know, this trust between designers and trades, um, and we can understand the client's objectives, we move forward together. Um, and then if we can do that, nobody's losing money. Everyone can, you know, everyone can make money at the same time. So I think that's really, you know, back to the relationships. I think that's hugely important. You start with trust. Yeah. Uh, and, and Jim, as we were talking earlier, we, you had brought up, you know, that, again, that unique perspective of the owner, is there some, sometimes some hard decisions that have to come in there in the last year uh, and, and supply chain and material costs was, was kind of mentioned through the conversation just a minute ago. And as we see, um, and it's, it's got to the point where it's all over the news and it's, it's out there in mainstream outside of construction that we're seeing 300 to 400% increases in, in material costs. And so from those relationships, as you look at it, uh, with your company, how has that changed over the last year? And what are you guys doing in that relationship side? Uh, it's been our number one focus. As an owner, um, you have to um, often work with the financial institutions as well as all the subcontractors and your estimating team. And the, the, the good part, if there is, is that we're all in this together. Everybody understands what's going on. And probably anybody on this call has met with some of the recent supply chain uh, challenges that there are out there today. And um, those business relationships just become key um, that you're having the conversations that you need about what to do with the situation. Um, often as an owner, it comes down to um, financially, if you were to say, put a project on hold, what that might mean to your project, uh, waiting until maybe the price of lumber or something else you're waiting on turns, um, or that you pay the price and you know go ahead and move forward with it. Um, Unfortunately, the cost ultimately gets passed on somewhere, most likely to the consumer uh, if it goes on long enough, or you have to relook at your performance as an owner and uh, maybe t the less on profitability and so on. So it just depends on the financial setup of the job, um, but we are all in this together and the relationships, uh, the trusted ones you have are key to it. Thanks so much, Jim. And, and Rhea, coming in from the UK, contractual relationships are a little different. BW primarily does fit out versus new ground up construction. And so talk a little about the relationships that your company has and how is that important of relationship over the last year with some of the fluctuating changes that we've seen uh, in, in material costs impacted your organization and what changes are you seeing being made? Well, first of all, I would like to say that relationships are very important and especially the relationship that uh, they create. They are created on sites where within subcontractors, project manager, commercial manager, and the, the client team. So I believe that if we all work together collaboratively uh, with one goal in mind, we can deliver quality projects. And quality projects lead to uh, you know better relationship, repeated business for us as a fit out com company with the client. And, you know, when uh, you build relationship and you have, you have repeated business, so you, your relationship is less contractual, so it's more amicable. Therefore, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it, it, it run, a project run smoothly. That's great. And you bring up, I think, a really good 
point, which is that, that it, it goes all the way down to the teams doing the work in the field. Uh, and, and from a process standpoint uh, and a people perspective, what has BW done to, to mitigate some of those challenges? How have you, whether it's better communication or, or new processes, what's changed? Yes, for us, uh, well, at BW, we have one strategy that we uh, use and it's called DFET Free. And we have built into this strategy all uh, our individual indicators uh, and that, that are built into our processes. And for instance, we look at things like uh, the number of punches uh, it, you know, towards uh, the end of the project. We look at uh, how many technical submittals are outstanding at a certain time during the life cycle of the project. And uh, we use Procore to generate reports. And if we see that one of those trends that we have identified as risky for our uh, budget, it's either too high or it's you know too low. It's an instant red flag for us. But we like like to look at things. Uh, we like to investigate more at the source of uh, uh, those indicators. For instance, uh, if we did understand the spec, if we record the changes correctly, and so on. Nice. And, and, and Bob, what about for your team? You know, when, when it talks about, you talk a lot about the relationships, but it's also, I think, um, there's a process piece that gets put in place as you communicate with the, the field teams. And, and what have you guys put in place over the last year to help mitigate that, that profit fade challenge? Um, I, I want to say one thing you asked about down to the field teams. And from my perspective, it's across the, the entire team um, because there good, is... Good direction. Uh, we're, we're all on the same team, shooting for the same goal, trying to crush it for our clients. And so, um, you know, it's, it's equally important for the trades and the field to, to do, you know, do their job and for the office to do their job. So um, what I think is, what I think the process is, we start to look at um, the ability for folks to deliver and no two, no two project teams are the same no two project managers or superintendents uh, do their job exactly the same. So we've actually built playbooks and they're just guide, guidelines uh, for how to operate. But we wanna give folks the latitude to operate and do really good work. Um, and then we refresh and reflect and look at how those teams match up together. And sometimes the, the pairing of folks isn't ideal and then we'll switch, but they're both phenomenal professionals. We'll switch the teams around. Um, so I think there's, there's processes in place, but they're general guidelines. They're not, this is how you must do it. Yeah, I, I love that. Cause that takes that both the, there's both a technology that you're bringing there, there of looking like, Hey, which teams perform and then, and then the people side of it. And, and when we were preparing, you talked about how, you know, sometimes the, maybe the superintendent, the project manager that are great friends may not make actually the best team. And can you expand right. a little bit on that? Yes. I mean, sometimes you can have two folks that are our best pals and they get along really well. And, um, but then, you know, their, their performance metrics are just, just okay and mediocre. And then you'll find that you might pair that superintendent with a different skill set project manager and they get the best out of both e both of each other, and they do the the you know the best final product for the client, um, and oftentimes that reflects uh, in the final results, both punch list wise um, or snags, um, and and, uh, and profit. So, and how you know how are you? Do you have a kind of maybe some specific examples for those watching about who? are, how are you using the technology to understand who's performing well and who's not? Like, what are those things that you're really looking at? So I think we, um, a couple different ways. One, we, we do an audit of how folks are utilizing, um, you know, Procore has the tools where we can see the analytics, where we can see who's using, uh, you know, daily logs every single day. So we use a daily log every single day on every project that's uh, use it internally, but it goes externally to all, all of the stakeholders on the project. So they understand what we're doing. Um, and then we also, so we look at those statistics, but we also look at statistics of 
um, and Maria and I have talked about this previously, but talked about like submittals and technical submittals. And you see those items uh, cause problems if you're, you know, if you're not following through the entire process. And so we, we it's kind of backward looking um, in that aspect where we look at it and go, what, what happened here? And then we reflect back and do the, the forensics on it and realize, oh, we, we left some stuff on the table and really didn't get clarity before we built it. And then we had to go back and correct it. Uh, uh, and, and Jim, anything to add there from, uh, from Ingerman? Are you guys process yeah. and technology wise? Yeah, process wise, um, as Bob uh, had said before, getting involved early on in the project, if you're for fortunate enough to with an owner, um, we, um, we use like Procore's uh, markup tool on the drawings to, to very early sets, 25% complete, 50% complete. And I kind of call it all eyes on the drawings. We get our project managers, our superintendents, um, myself, um, our estimators, all marking up the drawings for the design professionals and guiding them through the process so that we have those conversations early. Uh, about, you know, what's happening with the project. And, you know, it's also an opportunity for value engineering, you know, the, the, as, as you go along. Um, and as an owner, um, you develop your own standards. Uh, so we have standards books, whether it's detailing, could be products we like, it's anything that we consistently know works for us and not reinvent the wheel and say, uh, it's, a, it's a book for design professionals uh, to use to say, this is the way you work with us, but it's also stuff that's proven works uh, and brings value to the job for us. Uh, and so bringing value means, you know, we're not overpaying or, you know, that we can make a profit by using that. So that, um, that works well for us. Uh, and then coordinating, and also bringing in our subcontractors. So when we post in Procore the drawings and they have access, we're looking for their feedback on some of the most expensive parts of any construction project are those structural items or the mechanical, electrical and plumbing and the coordination of all of those. Uh, it's a, to me, that's where a lot of the change orders seem to come in is lack of coordination. So early on in the project, we're looking for those things to be coordinated. And we actually have teams meetings, video meetings similar to this um, every two weeks on a job to just talk through. Uh, I think a lot of the world of technology can be a little too email oriented, but just having a conversation and somebody will say something that suddenly everybody's like, oh yeah, we forgot we gotta, we gotta talk about that item. And um, it's all about communication to me and technology uh, and, and certainly Procore is all about um, just great communication and the ability for everybody to see the information. So that to me uh, pays dividends for um, being cost effective with a job. Yeah, and this is a bit of an on the fly question. Uh, Jim, it sounds like there, I heard that the, maybe the remoteness of teams and required, you know, not necessarily being in the office and that getting together over Zoom uh, and bringing those people together. And, and do you see that continuing even post in, in as a method of, here's how we can communicate better in another technology that construction is using? A absolutely. I think we, we find that uh, uh, being on a Teams meeting, being able to bring up Co uh, Procore on a shared screen, um, look through stuff, um, Spend the time doing that on a Teams meeting and not in your car driving, you know, to a meeting with each other. Uh, it's just a more effective use of time. And I do see it continuing for sure. Nice. I, I, any other thoughts, Maria, on that of, of how we see, you know, uh, beyond Procore, I think there's a lot of other technologies that we're seeing that are helping to reduce profit fade and, and help us be more productive. What is BW seeing there? Yeah, technology and access to live data, it's uh, an integral part of BW. And we use different type of technology, Salesforce, Power BI. We have a subcontractor database that we built in house. But throughout of all our projects, we have only one source of the truth and it's Procore. So by using Procore and throughout uh, all our live projects, we are able to collect all those trends, like Bob mentioned earlier on, you know, information on uh, technical submittals or drawings. And then those, uh, those trends help you understand where you might have to improve or also things that you're doing very well and you should continue to do uh, as good as you are doing because I'm working very well. 
But yes, technology is very important. And I think it, all the technology that every company uses needs to be connected to the overall strategy. Don't measure just something for the sake of measuring because then it won't be beneficial. And one of the things, uh, you know, I think in, in drawing from a bit of my own experience and, and maybe Bob, you can talk a little bit about this from your experience of, of having technology in different places is, uh, is analytics can, and insights can be so powerful. But I think one of the first things that, that you find is uh, where, the, where the, the process of gathering the data has gaps. That's, that's maybe one of the first things you see. And, and can you talk a little bit about then, how do you get that, that culture into the, in, into the field of, hey, this collection of data in real time is really important and that adoption that happens. But what is Gardner doing to make that happen? I think that's a great question. I think our, um, I think you build rigor into it, right? So you make it course of the day. And so you don't make it optional. You don't make it this additional burden. You make it part of the job. Um, and so, like I said, every day we do on every single project, a daily log and our superintendents, you know, if, if we look at others, they think that's, that's crazy. That's additional work we feel like it makes our superintendents more thoughtful and more uh, engaged in telling the story every day. And so when you're telling a client a story, uh, you're gathering data. You're gathering data to show, look, look and see. It's kind of show and tell. Here's what we've done today, but we're doing this to get prepared for tomorrow. And by the way, when we're working tomorrow, we're going to do this, 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 and this. So it makes you more thoughtful in your work, um, not just knee-jerk reaction. And I think so that's a proactive way that we can collect data, but ju just by making it a part of our everyday rigor. Hey, Kevin, can I uh, speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, I, I agree with Bob. What we, we have found with our field construction is um, teaching them that um, collecting that data, which may at first seem like it's a little additional work than they historically had done and using the technology is part of them being part of a, um, a, a collaborative process and showing them how it can help them. If we're collecting data on punch items or we're collecting data um, through inspections, and able to show real reporting. It's one thing if we say, well, we think we have a problem with XYZ subcontractor, but we don't have anything to back it up with versus saying, look at how many times these punch items have come up with this subcontractor or, um, or you know, on this framing inspection, we seem to have these difficulties that ultimately if we can go talk to those subcontractors, show them where they need to improve to do good business with us, it benefits our superintendents. So them seeing that life cycle of the data and how it works its way back to them and benefits them, to me, has been one of our biggest selling points to how we get the field uh, to take to the tools and, and teach them the bigger picture of the life cycle of data. We're also a big fan of business intelligence and how the root cause, seeing the root cause of things can help you define your best practices. Um, and that really is a, a cycle of improvement that you can generate. And, and Jim, I think having that data and having your superintendents be able to look at that, it makes them better superintendents by being proactive and not waiting for those items to come up. So the next project, they're going to say, generally, this is what's happening. So now they're, they're proactive around it rather than sitting back waiting for it to go wrong so they can point it out. They're active in it. And I think that's just a game changer. On that note, that's... What we have done at BW, we have collected the data. And then, uh, for instance, uh, we realized that we didn't have a specific process to deal with the punch items. Neither we did, nor our subcontractors. So we ran a workshop. And we ran a workshop with the entire operation at BW, but with each, with each preferred subcontractors that work uh, with us. So. By collecting the data, we were able to improve our internal process, but also our subcontractors came on board to improve the things that they weren't doing so well when they worked with us towards the end of the project. So the data serves well, not only to us, but also to our subcontractors. I, I mean, uh, the part of this 
conversation that, that I love so much, and I've shared this with Bob, of, of I grew up in, in the construction industry. My dad was a specialist contractor. And the part that, that I love about this is, is where I think sometimes is specifically for your trade partners is uh, there's this, oh, if I put in this data, it's because they're trying to find a way to penalize me. Or, or I'm, I'm doing it so that I can, can make sure that, that I'm covered. And how, how all of you were talking about it is that data, it's a, it's a all boats rise with a rising tide. The value of that data is so that we can create better partnerships across the entire stakeholder team of how to be better and have better relationships going forward and how do we work better together on the next project. And that, that to me is, is such a great uh, way to talk about the value of the data and the value of those, those indicators and those improvements in performance. So, uh, Bob, is there anything else? It looked like you might have wanted to say something additional. Uh, I just, I love that you use trade partners. Um, if I could get Jim and Maria to say it with me, uh, <laughs> they're the professionals that we rely on to do our projects. Um, and if they're not showing up with their smarts, we're no better at all, right? Our projects are going to fail. So we should be working with partners that are going to make us crush it for our clients but it starts with treating them with an element of respect. Well, that's why we call them trade partners because they're the professionals in the trades that do really phenomenal work. And um, you know, we have to hold them accountable, but they have to hold us accountable too in order to achieve great things for our clients. Yes, that, I agree. And uh, trade partners, uh, I agree. I'll start. <laughs> I'll start using that. Thanks, Jim. Than, so, yep, no problem. <laughs> and I think uh, holding us accountable, I think, is an important thing that Bob said because you have to be receptive to the feedback that your subcontractors are also giving you. You might be asking them to do something, but you've got to listen and understand that they they need something back usually in the business relationship as well that works for them, and it's a little different maybe for each subcontract or trade partner. There you go. Yeah. So I'm working on it. I, I, I love it. And I think it's, so I think kind of what we've heard here today is, uh, is in three things. One of which is those relationships are massively important, uh, uh, but also got brought up as, is one of the best places to tackle those challenges that happen in profit fade is, is in pre-construction. And uh, you know, Jim talked about it from the standpoint of collaborating with the entire stakeholder group even when drawings are at 50% and getting that impact and that feedback. And so uh, using technology to bring the team together and using one that, that, that I love what, um, you know, I don't know if, if Jim was, you said it or Maria, but that, that it's about collaboration and it's about creating opportunities for that entire team to collaborate together. So uh, love this conversation. I want to, again, uh, say thank you to Maria, Jim, Bob, appreciate your time. Uh, and, and your expertise and your knowledge to, to share with us today. So thank you so much. Thanks, Kevin. And thank you to our customers for sharing your experience. Built by construction pros for the construction industry, it's all part of our mission here at Procore to connect every stakeholder and process on a complete construction platform. We've talked about a lot today, but there's so much more that we want to show you. So whether you're brand new to Procore or ready to ramp up on these latest enhancements, we want you to view our team as an extension of yours. Our solution experts and customer success managers are here to show you what Procore's platform can do for your business. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Procore Innovation Summit. We truly value your partnership in building what's next. <laughs>